Event storage is a critical component to event sourcing. So let's take a moment to build a basic event store. In its most basic form, an event store needs to be able to store and serve back events. A consumption of events has a few purposes. We'll query these events to rebuild aggregate state so that we can guard business rules. But we also have listeners that need to be notified when events occur. We're going to build the store utilizing a relational database management system. Then we'll look at how to serialize and deserialize events. Let's get started. Our event store will consist of a single table and some code for interacting with it. Let's create the table and call it event store. Let's take a close look at the table's fields. First, we have an auto increment primary key. It's boring and typical, but it gives each record in the table a unique identifier. Next, we have our stream ID. This is the identifier that ties together events. For example, in the case of an aggregate, a stream ID would be the aggregate's ID. All of the events that were a part of that aggregate will be tied together with that ID. Next, we have the stream version. The stream version for each event is one more than the previous event in the stream. This is a mechanism to order the events in a stream and to ensure that they're being applied in the correct order. The next field holds the event name. This allows for querying against and retrieving specific events, but more importantly, when we retrieve events from the store, we'll use the event name to know which data structure, or in our case, which class to instantiate. The event data field stores a serialized form of the event's context. Traditionally, JSON is a preferred format due to the fact that it is standardized and as such can be used with any programming language. Now, despite the fact that we're using a schema to store the events, the event payloads themselves are stored in a form of schemaless storage. If we were to store these event data payloads in third normal form, we would need a database table for each and every event type. Of course, that would create a very expensive join statement anytime we wanted to query our event store and would quickly become a hassle for many reasons. Instead, due to the nature of the way that events are used, we don't need to query on the event's data. We can just serialize it in a simple to use format and optimize for querying against a large table of data. It should be pointed out that just because the event data field is schemaless doesn't mean that our event's data is schemaless. Our event does have schema. We have an expectation for what data is present. So we're going to need to make sure that we're satisfying that hidden contract when we're using the event store in this way. One simple way to do this is to just ensure that for every event name, you have one set of data. If you need to change the data in that event, you can simply create a new event name that represents a new version of that event. There are multiple ways to handle this schema problem. This is just one of them. Next, we have a metadata field, which can be used for any number of reasons. Many developers like to give each command an ID and then store the command in the same way that they're storing events. They can then store the command ID in the metadata of the event so that they can easily see which commands triggered which events for debugging and analysis. We won't be attaching metadata in this example, but you'll probably find some interesting uses for it. Be careful to ask yourself if you're storing metadata that would be better contained within the event payload itself. Does this data give context to the event that makes sense in the context of the domain? Finally, we have the stored at date, which is a simple timestamp. This timestamp exists to record the time it was stored. Contrast this to domain specific timestamps. For example, our order was placed event has a placed at timestamp. That is very specific to the event itself and therefore should exist within the event payload. So really that's it. That's our very simple event store database table. We'll be able to serialize events into it and then query them back out using SQL. Now let's take a moment to look at serialization and deserialization of events. Here is the current version of our order was placed event. It has four fields, the order ID, the customer ID, a product listing, and the time when the order was placed our product listing is implemented as an array of product IDs. And here we have our database table with the fields that we've just walked through. Let's add an example record. And what we need to do is to get from the object that represents our event to this record. Afterwards, we'll convert back from a record to our domain event object. There are a few approaches to explore. First, each event object can handle its own serialization and deserialization. An advantage of this is that the data and serialization behavior are together in one scope. There are a few moving pieces and it's easy to reason about. When it comes to serialization, we only need the actual object representation of the event. From there, we have everything that we need to store it. However, when we retrieve an event from the event store, we'll receive a database record with an event name and a payload. 
Then we'll need to turn this name and payload into an instance of our order was placed object. But how does our system know which class to instantiate? We could store the class name in the event store database table as just another column. When we retrieve the record, we can reference the class name and deserialize the record. Unfortunately, as tempting as this may be, it has catastrophic consequences. By storing any implementation references in the database, we couple our data to our implementation. This can lock down a team by preventing them from being able to make code changes because they also require database changes. Eventually, the complexity becomes so high that the system inevitably fails. This is an incredibly dangerous approach that must be avoided. Instead, the most simple solution is to store an event name to class name mapping in a key value pair. If the store comes across a database record named order was placed, then it knows that this is the correct class to instantiate. Of course, it's also possible for a secondary system to manage serialization. For example, there are a number of annotated serializer tools available that can handle this job. Should we choose to use an annotated serializer, it's important that we're happy with the data format. We should own our formats and not rely on the conventions of specific tools, because in the optimistic event of our system becoming increasingly valuable, we're more and more likely to integrate it with other systems and tech stacks that don't resemble our own. Focusing on owning our format prevents us from falling into the trap of using a specific tool's conventions to the detriment of future flexibility. The last option that we'll look at here involves simple serializer objects. One object for each domain event. Each serializer knows how to reduce a domain event to an array of primitives, or directly to JSON if you prefer, and then rebuild it. In this example, each object can define which event it knows how to build and deconstruct. The advantage of this system is that your domain event objects remain small and true to their core function, representing the event that occurred. A disadvantage is that many times a change to the domain event class requires a mirror change to the serializer class. These are just a few approaches, but of course there are more. Each approach will bring advantages and disadvantages that must be considered before applying them. Making the decision to not work with your team to determine what the right trade-offs are for your business and system is a mistake. Intentionally make a decision and live with it. Observe what works and what doesn't. Then iterate. Don't leave it to chance by picking the first one or the one we use in this example. There is a big difference between a learning project and production. It's best to implement these ideas to learn before implementing them in production. In our case, our team reviewed the options and we decided that we want to include the serialization behavior in the domain event class itself. So let's move into the event class. Here we have constructor injection and methods for retrieving the data. Now to fit this all onto the screen, let's hide these and take a look at the serialization methods. Our goal is to translate our objects into arrays that contain only primitives, generally strings, and this nested structure will then be converted to JSON at another step of the process. When we restore, we're going to take a nested array structure that's returned from the database and rebuild an instance of the object that represents our event. It's the deserialized method's job to instantiate any domain objects from the stored primitives until we have completely rebuilt the object that represents the event. So we have an idea how we can turn an event's data into a simple nested hash of primitives. Now we're going to need to make sure that we have the necessary information from the aggregate so that we can store things like the stream ID in the event store. Let's take a look at the updated interface for our aggregate. This interface contains methods to retrieve the aggregate ID and its version. In this example, I'm not actually using a PHP interface to apply to my aggregates. This is just a way to show what the public methods are that relate directly to the nature of being an aggregate. Returning the aggregate ID is simply a result of applying the order was placed domain event and storing the ID from it in a field that is then returned by the ID method. In order to have a version count, we need to increment an internal number every time an event is applied. Then we simply need to return that number if anyone asks what it is. So now we know all the bits that need to be stored. Let's take a look at the basic implementation that brings it all together. So in this example, we want to place an order. Here is an application service method that will coordinate that intention. We're going to interact with the order aggregate, then pull the events from it and store them into the event store. Once we pull out the list of domain events from the aggregate, we can loop through those and store them in our event store. We need to provide the aggregate ID, the domain event, and the version number. In this case, we're calculating the version for each event by looking at the ultimate version of the aggregate, 
and counting back for each event that's returned. Let's imagine that we only raised a single event, and that this event is the first to be raised in the aggregate. When we look at the current version, we know that it's going to be 1, because there's only been a single event applied to this aggregate. We can find the starting version of the aggregate by subtracting its current version from the total number of events that have been raised in this transaction. In this example, our starting version will be 0. Then, for each event, we increment the version once and store it in the event store. Our arguments are the stream ID, in this case the aggregates ID, the actual event, which will be serialized later, and the version of the aggregate after this event was applied. As you can see here, the stream version for this event will be 1. The stream version is the total number of events that have been applied in this stream as of the currently stored event. Now, all of this event version calculation is a bit complicated. It does get the job done, but we can simplify it. What if, inside of the raise method, we wrap our domain event in an envelope? It would give us what we need to turn this example into this. We'll call this envelope stream event because it places the domain event into the context of being a part of a stream. It'll contain the stream ID, the stream version, and the actual event itself. Now, let's take a look at our aggregate base class. Specifically, let's look at our raise method. Typically, it'll just be put into temporary storage awaiting release, and then it'll be applied or projected directly to the aggregate state. Let's make just the smallest change here. Now we're storing stream events instead of just the naked domain events. Of course, we're not done. There's a bit of a problem here. Do you see it? Since we haven't applied our event, we may not even have the ID as object state yet. For the same reason, our version is definitely going to be wrong. So let's swap the order of these operations. There. Now, when we flush the pending events from the aggregate, we'll retrieve stream event objects and our event storage will be far simpler. We know how to serialize and deserialize our domain event representations. We know how we can wrap each object with information about its stream to put it into the context of being in a stream. Now it's time to actually implement our event store code. Let's start by looking at our event store interface. The event store at this point only does two things. It'll give us a stream based on a stream ID. This is how we can pull back all of the events to rebuild an aggregate state. And it can also store events that are raised from an aggregate. Let's look at an example implementation. This code is functional, but was designed for explanation. It's very easy to imagine how it could be improved upon, and I encourage you to do exactly that using your own values. Due to the size of the class, we're going to look at each section separately. Let's start by injecting the dependencies. As events are stored, we'll need to dispatch them so that they can have a meaningful effect on the rest of our system. We'll also inject a simple class map object. It'll allow us to turn the name of an event into a class name, and then to do the inverse, turn our class name into the name of the event. Now, let's look at what it's like to retrieve a stream of events. We'll start by querying the database table for all events with the correct stream ID, sorted by their stream version. Then, we'll transform each of the events by looking up the class name for each event, translating that JSON serialized event data into an associative array, then passing that data to the correct class deserialized method, which will return a fully instantiated object that represents the occurrence. Once we've done that for all events in the stream, we'll finish up by returning a domain events collection object. Finally, when we interact with an aggregate and pull out events, we'll receive a collection of stream event objects. When we go to store these events, we'll loop through them, set the stream ID, the stream version, and we'll get the event name from our class map. We'll store the event's data as a JSON encoded string, and store the date time that the event was stored. Here you can also see the metadata field. You could do all kinds of things, pass in the user whose behavior triggered the events, etc. I'll leave that up to the specific use cases that you run into and your imagination. Finally, we're going to dispatch the event. And really, this concludes the entire cycle of storing and retrieving events, building and storing changes to aggregates, and updating read models. It's extremely important to understand the theory behind these activities. The code presented here functions and is enough to get started, but it might be best to use these practical examples only to boost your theoretical understanding. Build your own event storage. Create your own aggregate base class. As you can see, the amount of code necessary is very small and it's well worth your time to directly own and completely understand the most critical code in your infrastructure.